Welcome back to Cheatash. My name is Chris, and today we're going to be talking about Atomic Habits, the book by James Clear. Today, talking about Chapter 5, The Best Way to Start a New Habit. If you guys remember last time, we discussed Chapter 4, and some of the big topics that we discussed in Chapter 4 were the Habits Scorecard, where you actually make a list of all the habits that you do throughout your day. And then you put a plus or a minus or an equal sign next to them, basically indicating whether they are positive or beneficial to you, or if they are not beneficial to you, or if they're very neutral. This is an excellent way to point and call out. And we talked about this point and call out system in regards to trying to cease a bad habit. Because if you know that you have some habits that are not beneficial to you, they are not helping you in your life, when you identify them and then you see them throughout the day, you can point and call it out. And that would better help you to stop that habit in its place. So you don't have an automatic response to whatever certain cue triggers that habit. So that was last time. Today, we're going to go deeper into this first law of atomic habits. So let's let's kick things off. James starts off this chapter by talking about a 2001 study in Great Britain where they took 248 people and they were aiming to study how to build better exercise habits. So they had three groups. The first group, all they did was just track how often they exercised. They had a second group that did the same thing. They tracked how often they exercised, but they were also given reading material on the benefits of exercise, and they were also giving motivational speeches on the potential upsides of exercising. So they had experts come in both from reading material and speeches given to them saying, hey, look how great exercise is. Then there was a third group that was the same as the second group, but they formulated a plan. So they got the same speech and reading materials, the same motivation on the benefits of exercise. Plus, they were asked to formulate a plan of when and where they would exercise. So they specifically answered this question. During the next week, I will partake in at least 20 minutes of vigorous exercise on blank at this time in this place. Now, what happened? What happened was, and I think I have it actually on the next slide here. Yeah, sorry about that mishap there at the time. <laughs> but what actually ended up happening, I should have asked you guys what you, what you guys thought happened from those three groups, but I guess it's too late now. 91% of the third group exercised at least once per week. That's almost like double with the first two, that is more than double what the first two groups got respectively. So only 35% and 38% respectively of the first two group, groups exercise at least once per week. So what does this tell you? Motivation, it's, it's not really a motivation thing, especially like an external motivation because, you know, people can keep telling you about, oh, all the benefits of quitting smoking or of quitting caffeine, et cetera. But it's not that that's going to make you do a habit and make a habit stick. And we see that from the third group. And James points out that the, the, the two most common cues for a habit, again, this is like the first step, right? Cue, craving, response, I forget, oh shoot, I forget now, hang on, I'm going to look this up really quick for you guys, really, really quick. Q, craving, response, and then satisfaction. Was that it? I know there was four, Q, craving, response, reward, sorry, yes, Q, craving, response, reward. So the two most common things to cue a habit are time and location. When you're in a certain place or at a certain time, you're going to tend to do that habit. Just think about it when you first wake up in the morning. When you first wake up, that's a time. Location could be your kitchen. You make that cup of coffee. That's your habit. When you sit down 
in the morning, when you sit down at the kitchen table, you open up your phone. It's automatic. So why not cue the positive habits or the habit that you're trying to introduce using those same two, two attributes? So James talks about how you can have a formula and you can write down this formula and this could be your plan, your habit plan for the day. And it's actually called an implementation. So you say, when situation X arises, I will perform response Y. This is one way to write it. And then there's going to be a more, there's going to be a better way to write it, I think, on the next slide. So it's called your implementation. So what you're doing here is you're, is you're making it concrete so that once you arrive at that time and location, you can trigger that habit and you can now form that habit over time. So James goes on, and like I said, it's, it's not about a lack of motivation. It's more so clarity. Because you could say something like, oh yeah, I want to study more. But it's so vague, and you're not very clear on when you should study. But when you say something like, oh, when 10 a.m. hits this Saturday... I will be at the library studying for my physics exam. So now you have a time, 10 a.m. on Saturday, and you have a place, and you know what you have to do. Now you're clear, and the intention is super clear. Once the implementation is set, no decision needs to be made. You just automatically do it. It's the same thing that happens, again, when you are bored on your couch, at 1 p.m. and you open up your phone. I feel like a phone is like kind of a bad habit that maybe a lot of people have, so that's why I'm using that as an example. But it's the same thing as the library example. 10 a.m. on a Saturday, I'm studying at the library for my physics exam. And you're an answering this question, I will do this behavior at this time in this location. And then anything that comes in between you and your intention that you set out beforehand you don't do. It's the same thing we talked about in the book, The One Thing. When you find your one thing, it's easy to say no to other things. And you don't spend time doing other frivolous things. You just focus on your one thing. And it's kind of the same thing here that James is talking about. So you want to make the intention so obvious you can't wait to do it. It all, again, we're talking about the first step here. Q, cra and I'm going to get this right now, Q, craving, response, reward. It's the first step. You want to make it obvious. So now there's another way to make it obvious. So what we just talked about, and I'm pretty sure he called it, he called it the implementation intention. Now this, we're going to talk about habit stacking. This is another way to make it obvious, make a habit obvious. And he's, James starts out this chapter by talking about the Diderot effect. And hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. But it's a French philosopher who in 1765, he was working. He was very famous for writing a very famous encyclopedia series. He had a daughter. She was soon going to get married. But he didn't have a lot of money for the wedding. So what, what happened was Catherine the Great, famous Russian diplomat, offered to buy the Encyc Encyclopedia series. And he's ecstatic now because now he's got enough money to pay for the wedding. But what ends up happening is he, f <laughs> he sees a nice robe, this beautiful robe, and he buys it. Okay, like that's cool because he's got tons of money now. He still has enough money to pay for the wedding. But then he starts to think, oh, I need something to add on to this robe. I need it to match the carpet. So he buys a new carpet. Oh, well, now that carpet means that my couch or my seating arrangements are 
not really in style anymore. They're not really matching the carpet. So now he buys, he starts buying everything new in his house and he just chains together this huge spending habit. And he felt like he just needed to keep adding nice things just to, just to do them. He got in like a weird, a very negative spending loop, a very not beneficial habit, I might say. So it's called the Diderot effect. And it basically says that you tend to carry the momentum of some sort of habit. And it tends to cycle through and through it to the point where it becomes something that's automatic. So why not use this to your advantage when you want to start a new, more positive habit for yourself? So this is where habit stacking comes in. And habit stacking was something created by a professor, BJ Fogg of Stanford University. So he basically says, why don't you find a behavior you already do every day and then stack a new behavior on top of it? So the mission statement here differs a little bit from the implementation statement we talked about earlier, which is I will do this behavior at this ta time in this place. This is saying after I do this behavior, I will do this new behavior. And then you just stack it on top of the current habit. And the stacks can get bigger and bigger and higher and higher. And you're essentially taking advantage of the momentum of one behavior and you're keeping it going. So yes, I was right. Unlike the implementation intention, that was the name of it, habit stacking has the time and place already built in. So you don't even have to think about that. This is one of the benefits of going this route in making it obvious and performing this first step of habit formation. The time and place are already built in. You already know the time and place. It's when you do the old habit, which is assumedly automatic for you. So you don't even have to worry about that. You just know, okay, I go into the kitchen, I, make, I drink a ton of water instead of drinking the coffee, something like that. But there's some troubleshooting and some things to just kind of be wary of when you are forming these new habits. When and where the habit takes place are important. So keep in mind, if the place that you pick for your habit, especially if we're talking about the first implementation, the implementation intention, the, the first way to form a new habit, if the place you choose is chaotic or unorganized, you might have to find a different place for your habit. So in the studying example, if I say, hey, at 10 a.m. on Saturday at the <laughs> football game, I'm going to be studying for my physics exam, it's not really a good place. It's not really a good place. And, you know, building off that, if you say, oh, at 10 p.m. at night in the, in the library, well, you can't really do that because the library is closed probably. So you just need to be cognizant on when and where when you're doing the implementation intention and just be, be aware of stuff that's going on around you. And if things are distracting, you might have to play around with the time or the place on where you want to do that habit. Also, you don't want to stack a new daily habit on top of another habit that only happens on Mondays. So if I have a habit that says, you know, I want to read 10 pages in the morning, every morning, and I'm going to stack that on top of a habit where uh, after drinking coffee in the morning, but maybe for some reason you only drink coffee on the weekends. Well, that's not really going to work. Your goal is to read every single day, right? So that won't really work. So just be cognizant of that as well. And again, habit stacking works really well when the cue is very specified and you can take action on it immediately. So just remember that. And to summarize this chapter, remember the first law. Remember the first law. The whole point 
of these last two chapters was how can we make something obvious so we can cue it right away. Time and location are the most common cues that James talks about. So there are two ways to accomplish this cue response. Or I don't want to mix the two different. So th there's two ways to accomplish this cue or to get this habit ready to make it very obvious. There's the implementation intention and there's the habit stacking. In the implementation intention, you're pairing a habit with a specific time and place. I will do this at this time in this place. Habit stacking is where you pair a new habit with a current habit so you can keep the momentum going from that original habit. So you say, after I do this original habit, I will perform this new habit. And that's how we make it obvious. Guys, thank you very much for listening. Be on the lookout for those interviews on the podcast. Again, we interviewed Uncle Bob C. Martin. Very good interview. We'll be back next time with the next chapter of Atomic Habits. Probably do another JavaScript video again coming up soon. Just want to and to go along with this chapter, keep up the momentum for Atomic Habits. And yeah, no, just thank you guys very much for listening. Oops, I'm sorry. There it is. My name is Chris. This has been Chitash. Take care, everybody.